We have a banger of a card this week, and there's a little extra something on the line for you and I that we'll get into later. As always, you can call me Kunith. Let's make some money this week. Magomed Ankalaev won, right? We're in agreement there. He won. And do we also agree that Paddy Pimblett definitely did not win? If you, all the real MMA fans know that he lost, and I had money on him. I was happy that he won, but I was also annoyed that he won because he clearly lost. I know a lot of you guys did well in your captain mode games. We'll talk more about captain mode later in the week. That's something that we're going to build into the schedule here, but this is the first look. This is where we're going to go through the entire card, fighter by fighter, salary by salary, but we're going to go in bout order from top down, starting with Sean Strickland. He's our main event favorite this week against Jared Cannonier. Strickland is looking to bounce back here after getting laid out like church clothes by Alex Pereira. And what I love about Sean Strickland, especially when we're talking about DraftKings, is we know what we're going to get from him. Really solid striking defense, high pressure, forward movement, busy hands. Busy hands might be an understatement. If you look back at his fights with Jack Hermanson, Uriah Hall, these are five round fights where he put up a combined 339 significant strikes. And he can wrestle too if he has to. He's no slouch on the ground, but I expect him to keep this fight standing as long as possible. And that should be easy for him this week against Jared Cannonier, who's going to be looking to strike and hoping to find that big knockout shot. And that's always a possibility when Jared Cannonier fights, because he has serious power in both hands and deceptively quick hands as well. Plus, he's got 25 minutes to work, and with a guy in Sean Strickland who's coming off a knockout loss, he's not going to shoot for many takedowns. I would love to get to a big puncher like Jared Cannonier in this spot, but I don't think I can because Sean Strickland's going to land north of 150 strikes. In 14 UFC fights, Cannoneer has never gone over 100 significant strikes. You see, these are the strike totals. These are the significant strike totals. Not once has he gone over 100. Now, a good amount of these fights are finishing inside the distance, so he gets a pass there, but for some of these, like a five-round decision against Kelvin Gastelum, only 81 strikes landed. That's no good. Now, he's very accurate, and I'll give him that, but he doesn't throw enough against a guy like Sean Strickland who's going to drown you with volume and pressure. And it's very educated volume and pressure too. Sean Strickland isn't sitting down on a lot of these punches. He's kind of like how Nick Diaz used to be back in the day. Touch, 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 power. And we've seen Jared Cannonier knocked down in the UFC before, and as he slows down, I expect Sean Strickland to start landing heavier and heavier, so give me Sean Strickland to get it done this week. I actually like him by finish sometime in the fourth or fifth round. The pick for me in this fight is Sean Strickland by knockout. In the co-main event spot, we have Armin Saruki, and he's going to be fighting Demir Ismagulov. Tough fight because both of these guys are so solid everywhere. Right now, and I say right now, but it always kind of feels this way, 155 pounds has this pocket of killers that I just can't get over. And the UFC is doing a good job of matching these guys up with each other. And I'm talking about Armin Sarukian, Matus Gamrat, Demir Ismagulov, and Guram Kutatalatse. These are some of the sharpest guys in the division, and they would all eat Patty Pimblett's lunch, might I add. What I like from Sarukian, obviously, is the cardio. We saw him uphold a frantic pace last time out against Matush Gamrot in a five-round fight. I like the wrestling. He's great during scrambles, very slippery, and he took down Islam Makachev in his UFC debut at 22 years old. That's saying something. And I like how we've seen him grow over the years in the UFC as a mixed martial artist. He's seemingly gotten better every time we see him fight, and he's going to have to be at his best to this week to knock Demir Ismagulov off his game. Because Demir Ismagulov is a beast in his own right. He has elite takedown defense, very sharp striking, and high fight IQ. I think he matches up well against a lot of guys in the lightweight division, but my one big knock on him is his power or lack thereof. Earlier in his career, prior to the UFC, he was knocking guys out left and right, but as we've seen him in the UFC, he has not been knocking guys out. He's got one knockdown in all of his UFC fights. Armin Sarukian's only been knocked out once in his career, and that was seven years ago in his second pro fight ever at 19 years old. We'll give him a pass. So I say that to say this. This fight probably plays out on the feet. I don't see either guy having having a ton of success grappling considering what they look like defensively. And if their grappling cancels each other out, they're going to be forced to strike. And for that reason, I lean Armin Sarukian. He's younger. He hits hard. His striking has really caught up with his grappling. And I don't think he needs to respect the power coming from Demir in this spot. So I see him landing bigger strikes, moving forward for a majority of the rounds, and ultimately winning more minutes. He's also the younger, more marketable prospect. And that always helps when the scorecards come into play. So give me Armin Sarukian this week by decision. 
Next, we have Amir Albazi. He finally has an opponent. He was supposed to fight Alex Perez. He was supposed to fight Brandon Royval. Both of those fights fall through. And now he's going to take on Alessandro Costa on short notice. We know how this is going to go. I liked Amir Albazi in both of those other matchups against Perez, against Royval, because he has an excellent ground game. We saw last time out him turn Francisco Figueredo into worm food, getting takedowns, finding the back, choking him out in the first round. Before that, he had a competitive fight with Zalga Zumagulov, who was a tough out for most people, and in his UFC debut, he absolutely dominated Malcolm Gordon. And if I liked Amir Albazi against Roy Val, I love him this week. Now, Costa isn't bad. He's just in a bad spot. He has decent striking, decent grappling, and he's very composed. I watched back a few of his fights, and he's very tight. He's not wild. I actually think that he has the striking advantage in this fight. The issue is he doesn't have one-shot knockout power from what I've seen on tape, and he can't allow Amir Albazi to get his wrestling going because if he does, he probably doesn't get out of the first round. And even if he does allow Albazi to get his wrestling going and he gets out of the first round, Albazi secures a takedown here. It's pretty much over. He's going to absolutely sap this guy's cardio, especially taking this on short notice, making his UFC debut, and he'll fade later in the fight. So I'm very confident in Amir Albazi to get the win here. I expect a first round submission for the Prince. Full camp, dominant grappler, favorable matchup. I'll take all of that. Give me Amir Albazi by submission. Hold on. Stop. Wait a minute, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, comment something for the algorithm, you know how the algorithm works. Now we're looking at a fight with Julian Arosa and Alex Caceres, two vets going at it who both throw a ton, have seen it all, and have shown toughness in the past. We have seen Julian Arosa knocked out before, but we've also seen him eat huge shots and keep coming forward. And for Alex Caceres, he's been in the UFC forever, and he's only been knocked out once. So we have two really well-rounded skill sets in this matchup, solid grappling on both sides, but I do see Arosa being the more willing grappler here. Last time out against Mean Hakeem, Arosa did a great job of moving forward, throwing, keeping his head off of the center line, striking his way into the clinch, and doing fantastic work in the clinch. He also mixed in some takedowns, or threatened takedowns with level changes, giving Dewadu some extra things to think about. He fought beautifully last time out as an underdog. And if Arosa looks like that this week, he's going to win. And while I respect what Bruce Leroy has done in his career, the longevity, the competition, I don't don't see him being a bad matchup for Juicy J. He's super experienced and technically skilled, but he's not dangerous enough for me to want to take a shot on him as an underdog in this fight. He's coming off a loss to Super Sadiq Youssef, and I actually picked him to win that fight as a big underdog because I thought he was just going to put in that veteran performance like he did before that against Sung Woo Choi. Because Alex Caceres is crafty, he moves really well, he moves like he's been fighting for his entire life, which he has. But Julian Arosa is too dangerous, man. He has 23 finishes in his record and it's almost split perfectly with knockouts and submissions. So that tells me that the guy is opportunistic, the guy's always looking for the finish, and that skill set again is well rounded enough that he can get it done in multiple ways. So I expect Julian Arosa to win this week and I think he's live for a finish here as well. Caceres is tough, he's a hard guy to put away, but Julian Arosa has that dog in him. And he's going to take the fight to Alex Caceres. So give me Julian Arosa this week, give me Juicy J inside the distance. Next we have another tremendous this fight with Drew Dober and Bobby Green. Money's coming in on Drew Dober. He's the favorite here, and I honestly cannot tell you why. When I think Drew Dober, I think a couple of things. Crazy durability, good cardio, physically a monster, and a jaw robust enough that even Giga Chad probably gets jealous. But he isn't the cleanest striker that we've ever seen. He's a below average MMA wrestler, and he relies on durability way more than you'd like to see. On the other side, you have Bobby Green, who is so damn gangster. He has some of the best hands in the division, cardio for days, underrated durability in his own right. Dude's been knocked out three times in 43 professional fights. And during that time, he's fought the who's who. The way I see this fight going, back and forth action, probably fight of the night. I expect this to go the distance given how tough both of these guys are, and I see Bobby Green being a step ahead in every phase of the game. In boxing range, I expect Bobby Green to throw more, land more, and showcase better defense. And once Dober starts to open up with these heavy shots he tends to throw, Bobby Green probably changes levels and looks for takedowns. And I think we can safely expect him to land over 100 
100 significant strikes and maybe one or two takedowns as he moves toward another decision win. I just don't see Bobby Green losing more minutes than he wins in this fight. The only way I see Drew Dober winning is by landing a big punch, knocking Bobby Green out, but that's so rare to see Bobby Green get knocked out that I can't bank on that outcome. So I'm going to go with what I think is the most likely outcome here, and the pick is going to be Bobby Green by decision. Next, we're looking at Mihal Alexachuk. Cody Brundage is going to fight him. He's stepping in on short notice to replace Albert Duraev. Albert Duraev absolutely dodged an ass whooping this week because middleweight Mihal is a problem. We saw him taking heads off at light heavyweight, but he always seemed a little small for the weight class. Now, he's six feet tall, 74 inch reach, so he's not a small guy by any means, but he never looked like he was filled out at light heavyweight. Kind of like last week when you looked at Drickus Duplessis versus Darren Till. They didn't even look like they were in the same weight class. Similar situation here. Alexa Chuck always looked a little soft in the body up at 205, so I'm happy to see him down at middleweight where he should have even more success. We saw how good he looked against Sam Alvey. Granted, looking good against Sam Alvey doesn't mean as much these days, but the way he packed Sam up so quickly and the reactions he was getting from Alvey when he was landing just goes to show that this dude throws hammers. On the other side, Cody Brundage is a solid wrestler and a solid fighter overall, but he has been chin checked in the past. We've seen that before. And when Alexa Chuck lands cleanly on Brundage this week, he's going to get floored. Brundage absolutely should not try to stand with this guy, and he probably won't. He's going to look to wrestle here. And Alexa Chuck doesn't have good takedown defense, making the path to victory for Cody Brundage very clear and very obvious. So this fight can go one of two ways, a knockout win for Mihal Alexa Chuck or grappling that leads to a finish for Cody Brundage. So we're left making decisions here. Decisions, decisions. I'll tell you what's not going to be a decision, the outcome of this this fight. One of these guys is getting finished one way or the other. And I have to side with Mihal Alexachuk to get the finish in this spot. The power, the output, the confidence in the hands are all enough for me to ride with him this week. And even if Cody Brundage is able to have success early wrestling, I don't think that matters when it comes to the power of Alexachuk. He carries it from round one to round three, and if we need to, we'll see it late this week. Cody Brundage was rocked by Dolce Lungambula before Dolce fed him his neck like a slice of pumpkin pie after Thanksgiving dinner. Mihal's not going to give him that opportunity. Once Cody Brundage is hurt, he's going to pour it on. He's going to find the knockout. Give me Mihal Alexachuk inside the distance, first round knockout. There's a lot on the line this week for me personally, because John Kelly DFS has finally accepted the challenge. I've put the challenge out there to some people before. No one's answered the call except John Kelly. So I thank you for signing the contract, doing something that others were afraid to do, but I do have to do what I need to do. I'm going to drag you into deep water, John Kelly. You're going to sleep where the crabs sleep. Next, we're looking at Cheyenne Vlismus versus Corey McKenna. I'll come right out and say that I like Cheyenne Vlismus to win this fight. With Cheyenne, we know exactly what we're going to get. She's going to throw a ton of strikes. Corey McKenna eats more shots than she lands. She has a negative striking differential. She gets hit more than she lands. Cheyenne is also going to be rocking a 5-inch reach advantage, and she does most of her work from distance, so the reach is going to serve her really well in this spot. She looked great against Mallory Martin last time out, landed that crazy head kick before that against Gloria DePaula, and in her first UFC fight, she lost to Montserrat Conejo. She had absolutely no answers for that head and arm. She was controlled in that fight for nearly 10 minutes, but when she was on the feet, she was doing good work. Corey McKenna has wins over Miranda Granger, who's awful, Kay Hansen, who's awful, and a contender series win over Vanessa Demopoulos, which is aging pretty well. But I can't get over the fact that she lost to Elise Reed in the UK. That's not a good look at all. And it was a split decision. Might have been a bad decision. Could have won either way, but I would hope that Corey McKenna would pitch a no-hit against somebody like Elise Reed who can't defend a takedown. But that wasn't the case, and now she's up against Cheyenne Vlismus, who if she can't get her down, Corey McKenna's getting pieced up here. Now I expect McKenna to try to shoot for takedowns, but Cheyenne's gonna stuff them, take the center of the octagon, and go to work. She's gonna double her up on strikes as well. That volume is gonna win Vlismus a majority of the rounds. And McKenna, she's young, but she's taken a lot of damage in her career. You see her getting lumped up in these fights, and I think that she probably is starting to cut easily. So if she starts bleeding, it's not going to give good optics to the judges, and if she's getting outstruck, then she's already kind of behind the eight ball. So give me Cheyenne Vlismus to win this fight. Give me Cheyenne Vlismus by decision. Next, we're looking at Jake Matthews. He's fighting Matt Semmelsberger this week. Jake Matthews floated on Andre Fialo last time out. He put together a career performance after being out of action for over a year. Came back, looked better than ever against a guy like Fialo, who had a lot of momentum at the time. We know how Fialo fights, so that win is super impressive in my opinion. Opinion. The shot selection, the movement, the feints, the power, it all froze Fialio, and I think he could do the same thing against Matt Semmelsberger. 
Hamelsberger is 30 years old. He's had six fights in the UFC, 14 fights total, but he still seems very raw to me. In the UFC, his wins are over AJ Fletcher, who stepped in on short notice, making his UFC debut and is now 0-2 in the promotion. He gave Semmelsberger everything he could handle in that fight. He has a knockout win over Martin Sano, who is legitimately not a fighter. And you might think, how could he not be a fighter if he's in the UFC? The guy is 4-3-1 in his career. This is the first time that he had fought in four years. Not a good look, not a fighter. He also knocked out Jason Witt, who has top 10 worst chins we've ever seen, and he won a decision against Carlton Minus, who went 0-2 in the UFC. So the experience and the competition isn't exactly top tier, and when he does come across complete fighters like Chaos Williams or Alex Morono, he loses. He doesn't have the fight IQ, the ring time, the gas tank, or the technical skill to win against guys like these, and Jake Matthews, 28 years old, has fought the who's who. He's been in the UFC since he was 20 years old, fighting guys like Kevin Lee, Li Jing Liang, Sean Brady, and since moving up to welterweight, he's looked awesome. He has been susceptible to being submitted in the past, but that's the weakest part of Matt Semmelsberger's game. Semmelsberger is a big, powerful guy, and I give him the punching power edge, but that's it. Every other aspect of fighting, Jake Matthews has the advantage, and I'm looking at it now, Jake Matthews is around minus 240, and I think that's a steal this week. In this space, we talk about how lines are too wide all the time, but this one is too narrow. Jake Matthews is better everywhere. He wins this fight. He could be a minus 500 favorite, and I feel like it still makes sense. So I see him winning this fight. I see him actually securing a takedown or two, finding the back and getting a rear naked choke. The pick for me is Jake Matthews by submission. Next, we're looking at a fight with Julian Marquez and Duran Wynn. Now, Duran Wynn is not only on the burger list, but the ink his name is written in has been begun to fade because he's been there for so long. He's coming off an absolute battering by Phil Hawes, one of the worst beatings of the year, and it didn't even make it to the third round. Julian Marquez is coming off a brutal spanking as well. It actually took place on the same night. Robocop dropped him three times and put him to sleep faster than a cup of chamomile tea, which was crazy because Julian Marquez is known for his durability. He's also known for finding ways to win. Julian Marquez is a finisher through and through, and he's dangerous for every second of the fight. Now, Duran wins path to victory here is to lean on his wrestling. He's 5'6 at middleweight, which is pretty absurd. Duran Wynn is built like a PT cruiser, and he's not going to outstrike most guys. He needs to close distance, get to some legs, and find a way on top. And Julian Marquez has poor takedown defense. We saw Maki Patolo, of all people, take him down five times. Alessio DiCirico took him down four times. Same with Darren Stewart. Duran Wynn has to use that to his advantage. He has to wrestle here. And as much as it pains me to say this, I think Duran Wynn could win this fight. If Duran Wynn can keep half of the toughness that he showed against Phil Hawes, I think he wins a decision. I worry about on the feet being the smaller guy, the much shorter guy, but when it comes to wrestling, that's advantageous. I also worry about the submission attempts coming from Julian Marquez because he's not afraid to take chances, and from what I've seen from Julian Marquez, he's very good at fighting on instinct. He's a shoot first, questions later kind of guy. And that's a double-edged sword that has served him well more often than not. So I'm torn. I'm torn because I like Julian Marquez and I don't like Duran Wynn, but I am picking Duran Wynn to win this fight because he has the wrestling and the poor takedown defense from Julian Marquez just feeds into that. So I'm going to try to get this out without throwing up all over my microphone. I think that Duran Wynn... Ugh, I need a minute. Oscar, can you do it? Can can you come do it? This is literally the only time I've ever asked you to do anything, and you're not going to come do it. You're going to get suspended without pay. For the rest of December and for the first couple weeks of January, you're not getting paid. The pick for me in this fight is Duran win by decision. There, I did it. It's out. I did it. Next, we're looking at a crazy matchup here between Syed Nurmagomedov and Syed Yakub Kakramanov. Nurmagomedov is coming up as a slight favorite here right now, but by Saturday, this is going to be a pick em because both of these guys look incredible right now. Kakramanov is two fights deep into his UFC career. He made his debut against Trevin Jones. I believe he stepped in on short notice. He was a replacement in that fight. He spent a lot of time in the wrong side of the clinch, but he he still looked good and ultimately found a submission late. He follows that up with a dominant performance over Ronnie Lawrence. He destroyed Ronnie Lawrence, even as a huge underdog. I had people messaging me. This is how bad the domination was. I had people messaging me. I had people like, Ronnie Lawrence sucks. He shouldn't even be in the UFC. My $6 parlay is ruined and now my kids have to have sleep for dinner tonight. Which is crazy because Ronnie Lawrence is pretty damn good. So for Kakramanov to go out there, take him down 10 times, control him for over 12 
12 minutes, a crazy performance, and super impressive. Now on the other side, you have Saeed Nurmagomedov, who is quietly putting together a phenomenal UFC career. He's 5-1 and one in the promotion with three first-round finishes, two of them being in under a minute. This guy has serious killer instinct, and we saw that when he fought Cody Stamen when he cinched up a guillotine to defend a takedown attempt, ends up winning that fight in 47 seconds. Last time out, he won against Douglas Silva de Andrade, but I think he underperformed. That fight was very close, and watching live, I thought the judges might have leaned De Silva for rounds two and three, and De Silva, 37 years old, not the strongest grappler, six and five in the UFC, not a great look. Kakramanov is 27, just getting started, a fantastic grappler, and you could tell by the way that he conducts himself during interviews that he wants people to watch him fight. He wants to stir up some drama on social media. He wants Syed Nurmagomedov to engage with him more than just the fight itself. And it's because he wants to put butts in seats. He wants to sell tickets because the kid has championship aspirations, and based on what we've seen, we have no reason to think he doesn't have championship caliber talent. From what I can see, Kakramanov may be the truth. He only lost twice once in a competitive fight that went the distance against Umar Nurmagomedov, and we know how good that guy is, and the other to a flying knee in 2019, and flying knee losses are tricky because on paper, it's all you got knocked out, you lost. But they are strikes that come from nowhere, they're very hard to defend against, especially if you find yourself moving forward, and they could be fluky at times. So I don't worry about Kakramanov's L's because I'm far more impressed with the W's. I really like him this week. I think he goes out there and out grapples Nurmagomedov and wins a decision, or he finds a submission. If I had to choose, I'd say Syed Yakub Kakramanov wins this fight by decision. Next, we're looking at a fight between Rafa Garcia and Mahashate. Rafa Garcia likes to wrestle, throws big overhand punches, fights with a lot of pressure. On the feet, I don't think Garcia has anything for Mahashate. The power difference is massive, and we've seen just how poor of a striker Garcia is in the UFC. Garcia is really good against guys who he's able to take down, control on the mat, but if Mahashate is able to keep the feet, I fully expect him to not not Garcia out. Rafa has wins over Natan Levy, who was making his UFC debut, and a guy who I think is overrated. He also beat Jesse Ronson, who's winless in eight combined fights across UFC and PFL. For Mahashate, he cashed as a huge underdog on Dana White's contender series, then he cashed as a dog again this past summer when he starched Steve Garcia in just over a minute. This guy has power, and he's big for the division, standing at six feet tall versus a 5'7 Rafa Garcia, and he's still young, so he's still figuring things out. But just like last week, we need to zoom out here. When we're picking fights, we need to look at everything, not just the fight itself. Where am I going with this? Well, Mahashate is 23 years old. He's Chinese. He has a nice 9-1 record, and he put himself on everybody's radar at UFC 275. The UFC has a real opportunity to have a star on their hands with Mahashate if he's brought through the ranks properly, which makes me think that he was matched up strategically this week. Because the UFC has all of that to gain if he wins, but if Rafa Garcia wins, what do they have to gain? A guy who's 5'7 at 155, 3-3 three three in the UFC, normally goes the distance, primarily a wrestler, and struggles to make weight with only one knockout win in his career? Just like Raul Rosas Jr., just like Paddy Pimblett, this is strategic matchmaking by the UFC, and we could take advantage of it. I like Mahashate to win here. The pick for me is Mahashate, and it's gonna be knockout, and I'll get a little bit more specific for you, second round. Next, we're looking at a fight with Renat Fakhradinov. He's fighting Brian Battle this week, and I'm telling you, Renat better pack a lunch. He made his UFC debut this summer against Andres Mihailidis, and after that fight, I said that he is an easy fade next time out. And the UFC has matched him up this week against a guy who I am very high on in Brian Battle. Battle is coming off of a beautiful high kick knockout and under a minute against Takashi Sato. He cleanly beat Trishan Gore, doubling up on strikes and choking out Gilbert Urbina to win the Ultimate Fighter. The way that Battle moves, the way that he throws his strikes, and the way that he works on the ground is going to give Fakhradinov problems. Fakhradinov in his debut was fortunate to find himself against Mihailidis because the dude gassed out and gave up on himself pretty early in that fight. Mihailidis is no threat on the feet and he's a jobber. He's a guy that is brought in to lose. They fed him to Alex Pereira in his UFC debut and Renat back to back. But Renat doesn't really impress me from what I've seen and outside of the UFC he's fought largely very low level guys. He was originally in this spot supposed to fight Michael Morales and I loved Morales here. And I'll tell you, I like Brian Battle even more. Brian Battle looked like death on the scales last time out, but if he can show up, that's all I care about. He's got that dog in him clearly, and I think he finishes Renat this week. Because Renat is used to finishing guys or having his way, but Brian Battle's going to give him everything that he can handle, and I expect him to break at some point. If Brian Battle
stuffs a takedown or two, finds himself on top, I think Renat's confidence is shot. At that point, he's going to look for a way out. We know he's a great hammer. We don't know if he's a great nail. So that's why I like Brian Battle this week. Give me BB inside the distance. There are a couple of BBs that we need to shout out. First, rest in peace to Christopher Big Black Boykin. Obviously, Legion of Boom, Brandon Browner. And now, one fight away from staking his claim in the BB Hall of Fame. Brian Battle. Next, we're looking at Manel Kopp. He's going to be fighting David Dvorak this week. It's good to see the man back in action. We haven't seen him in a year since he smoked Zolga Sumagulov in the first round, which is impressive because no one's really doing that to Zolga Sumagulov. Before that, he landed a crazy flying knee against Ode Osborne, and now he has a fight against David Dvorak, who really doesn't jump off the page to me. I think Dvorak deserves to be in the UFC. I think he's UFC caliber talent. He's solid, but there isn't much to like for him in this matchup. No takedown upside, relatively low striking output, and physically, he's completely outgunned here. Manel Kopp is a tank for this division, and he hits way harder than the average flyweight. I expect Kopp to throw more, land a lot heavier, and control David Dvorak in the clinch. And I think it's worth mentioning that Manel Kopp has fought tougher guys overall. He's shared the octagon with guys like Kyoji Horiguchi, Alex Pantoja, and a common opponent in Matus Nikolaou. Even Zolga Zumagulov and Ode Osborne are tough outs for most guys at 125 pounds, and I think when you look at the physical advantages, the resume, the numbers, and what stands out on tape, Manel Kopp is easy money this week. He's around minus 240 right now, just like Jake Matthews. If you parlay them together, that's an easy way for you to double your money. We talked about the same thing on Twitter last week with Raul Rosas Jr. and Patty Pimblett. Now, Patty should have lost, but the bet came through and the logic was there and we doubled our money. I recommend that you do that this week as well because I think Manel Kopp wins here and I think that he knocks David Dvorak out. So give me Manel Kopp by knockout. And you can follow me on Twitter at Kunith MMA. I drop bets, I drop props, I drop parlays, and I talk a little smack during the fights, especially to you, John Kelly. I'm coming for you. And we're going to wrap up here by talking about Sergey Morozov. He's fighting Journey Newsom this week, we have good reads on both of these guys, at least in their last fights. Last time out, we thought Morozov would beat Halley and Paiva, and it was a competitive fight, but Morozov goes on to win a decision. In that fight, he was blasting Paiva with heavy punches, but we know that Paiva has that ridiculous chin, and he was able to eat most of Morozov's offense. But that offense from Morozov is serious. He throws fast, tight combinations, and he moves very well. On the other side, we had Journey Newson to beat Fernie Garcia, and he came through as a slight underdog for us. He out struck Fernie, never seemed to be in any danger, mixed in takedowns effectively, but I have to say I wasn't impressed with that performance. He threw a ton of spinning kicks, side kicks, high kicks, and it was largely ineffective, and that was a ton of wasted movement that's not going to serve him well this week against the guy who's as tight and technically sound as Sergei Morozov. I expect Morozov to land the cleaner strikes and to take Newsom down in spots to win rounds. He's another guy rocking around a minus 250 price tag, and it's justified because he's just a much better fighter. I like him to win Win this week, and unfortunately for Journey Newsom, that puts him at one win in five UFC fights. Not a good look. So the pick for me in this fight is going to be Sergey Morozov by decision. If you've made it to this point in the video, I thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit some of the timestamps if you need to go back and look at some things. For DraftKings, if you're wondering what you should do, what contest you enter, how to build lineups, there's going to be two videos on the screen somewhere right here if Oscar can get his head out of his ass, and those videos will show you some strategy and help you win more often on DraftKings. Best of luck. I look forward to seeing you later in the week for our final picks and for that Captain Mode video. Let's go!